this morning uh, from the works of the flesh. Uh, we're going to look at this phrase, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, from Galatians chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, and this will go through your handout today. Now we find in scripture a picture painted of the deeds of darkness uh, that are really lived out by so many people of the world today. So many people are doing this. Uh, I have three main passages that you'll see at the top of your sheet. Uh, I would really like to deep dive and do a deep dive study in those passages today. And I think you'll see what I mean about these three passages painting a picture for us so that we can know what the deeds of darkness are of this category. We see in these passages a scene of sin. Certain types of behaviors unacceptable to God. The sinners of this world, including you and me, before we became Christians, uh, took part in some things that the Bible clearly condemns. And I don't want any of us to be confused about sin uh, this morning. So this morning's lesson really is a Bible study. We're going to study this morning. This is, uh, we're going to dive in and look at some of these things. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we're going to dive into the word of God this morning. Make sure we understand. We're going to soak it in and uh, absorb what it says. So uh, these, these three passages this morning, they're going to be Romans chapter 13 and verse 13, uh, 1 Peter 4 and verse 3, and then Galatians 5. 19 through 21. You're going to go home today and you're really going to get these verses, okay? I'll lay a bunch of groundwork first and then we're going to read them. And as you, as is seen on your handout, I want to zoom in on some sins highlighted in these three passages. And I just want to take a look at their definitions as we start here this morning. So when we read some of these words on the list in our 21st century brains, it's very easy for the meanings of some of these old words uh, to somewhat be lost when we read it because we don't really use some of these words the way that uh, we don't really use them anymore. And so we're going to be talking about the Greek definitions and uh, the way it was writ originally written, what it meant originally, and how we can understand what these words mean because these exact actions are still taking place today. Don't be confused about that. These are still taking place today, only we use different terminology to describe some of these things. So that's what happens in a Bible study. You can understand it with, with your language. You'll notice that your handout breaks down uh, actually 10 Greek words here found in the text of the Bible found in these three passages. You'll also notice that these particular sins are always listed together. You get them always all together as a group. And I believe this is because these types of sins usually go hand in hand with each other. Even though each one of them is individually sinful by itself, we'll notice that most people don't just commit one of these sins when they do them. Typically, when one is engaged in, the others aren't far behind, and the others are engaged in as well, which is why they're always grouped together in Scripture. Many people of this world typically consider it fun to practice all these things at the same time. But here again, the Bible calls it sin. Uh, the, Bible calls your, the Bible calls your fun sin, God says to the world. So we need to learn to have fun without sinning. And rest assured, you can still have fun without sinning against God. You can. It's possible. Because, you know, we cannot afford to miss out on heaven for the sake of, quote, fun. Now, I'll tell you what, hell's not going to be fun. So we need to think of it that way. We're here to serve God, and there are many ways that we can enjoy this life without sinning against God. All right, before we read the three passages, I'd like to first define the words, and then we'll read, uh, we'll read them so we can have a full understanding, and then we'll, we'll read these passages afterwards. So the first Bible word that we're going to study this morning is the word uh, revelry. King James Bible uses, usually translates this word as revelings. But I'll tell you what, we don't usually use the word revelry anymore, do we? I don't. Uh, so we better take a look at the definition what this word means, see what, how we would describe it in our language. And I think it'll become abundantly clear this morning what terminology we would use. The word here used in the Greek is komos, and this particular Greek word is defined like this, a revel or carousal as if letting loose. 
Okay, for me, the words revel and carousal don't do much for me. I, maybe for you it does. I don't really know those words offhand. I do now because I've studied them. But um, I've heard of the phrase let loose, letting loose. We, we, we understand that concept. Here it was a paragraph written with the Greek definition as part of the definition, which I think sheds some significant light on the word revelry. Revelry is part of the definition. That's the first part. Here's the part of the explanation with it. Revelry is defined like this. A nocturnal, well, it's nocturnal. That means something taking place typically at night. A nocturnal and riotous procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows who often, uh, who after supper parade through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus or some other deity, who sing and play before houses of male and female friends. Hence, this this word is used generally of feasts and drunken or drinking parties that are protracted till late at night and indulge in revelry. Okay, I can understand some of those words, and I can picture that scene in this ancient picture that, that, that we're looking at. Picture a bunch of drunk guys parading through the ancient streets, all excited with music and torches, and they go to people's houses and, and sing and perform and those kinds of things, merrymaking. And they go around singing and making lots of noise late at night. Got it. I, got, I understand that part of the definition. By the way, uh, this is part of the way that many worship their false gods in the Greek and Roman culture. Uh, it involved music and drinking and uh, feasting, and the, the group would get drunk as part of their worship and do promiscuous things, things that Christianity would identify as, well, you should be doing those things anyway, now you, the, the, they're doing it in their worship. Also, I like the phrase in this uh, of it is a procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows. It's interesting. Have you ever been around someone who's drunk? Or seen someone in a movie that's drunk, how they act. We know that a drunk person is just giggly, over the top, energized. They say and do whatever they want, obnoxious things. Why? Because they're drunk. Uh, they're not themselves. And so this is part of what we're getting into is the, the origin of the word revelry, where it came from. All right, then I looked up the word revel, because that's part of the definition. It means to revel. I looked that up in our terminology on Google for some further context, and here's how that's defined on Google for us today. Lively and noisy enjoyment, especially with drinking and dancing. It's a synonym for our word partying. Okay, now I'm really starting to understand what we're talking about here. But just to make it clear, I looked up the word partying as well. Partying in our language is de defined as to enjoy oneself at a party or other lively gathering, typically with drinking and music. Another word I looked up, which is also in the Greek definition, it was the word carousal. And that word, that was one I didn't usually use or know, but it's the act of celebrating and enjoying oneself, usually by drinking alcohol and speaking and laughing loudly with other people. The King James rendering of the word rioting is defined like this, to behave in an unrestrained way, rowdy, disorderly. So we're seeing the scene implanted in our minds a little better now, aren't we? Today, you might picture something on a Thursday or a Friday night just outside of a college campus. A bunch of late teens and young adults pull out the alcohol after a long week and wish to, quote, let loose. They're unrestrained. They're loud. They're rowdy. And they're laughing at everything and speaking loudly with other people. Part of, well, nowadays, because the music's so loud, right? And the music's playing loudly. Lively and noisy enjoyment is the meaning of these words. You can visualize a scene that is dark. It's usually very late at night. Uh, when I went to Saginaw Valley, not, not a Christian school, I was going to be in the school system. But those who would invite people over for this kind of a party would typically start these parties at 11 p.m. or midnight or later, uh, and they would go into the very late at night, early morning. So you can also visualize uh, the dancing of the young men and the women late at night. They're not married, 
and they're dancing on each other and all that. So you, everything I'm describing is wrapped up very well in this Greek word, revelry. Now uh, it's party, but dancing and drinking, letting, as if letting loose, it says. So that's our first word this morning, which the Bible calls a sin. We'll, we'll read what the Bible says about it in just a minute. Secondly, uh, among these uh, three passages, I found two different Greek words, both translated as drunkenness. So these are actually two different Greek words. One of them is defined as to intoxicate, to make drunk, to get drunk. I believe that's the Ephesians 5, uh, 5 18, 19 one of uh, to grow drunk, the process of getting drunk. And then the other one was an overflow or surplus of wine. So people getting together for a party, the, then the sin of drunkenness is listed. People getting drunk on this stuff, now losing their wits, they're, they're being softened. But then there's this Greek phrase translated as the like. I want you to think about that this morning. This is a Greek word which means like, similar, or resembling. So here's how Galatians 5 uses this phrase for condemning these actions. These actions are condemned. Drunkenness, parties <laughs> of that nature, reveling, and things that resemble this scene is the idea. Paul says by the Holy Spirit, Christians don't need to take part in anything resembling this kind of activity. Don't be roped in with revelry. Christians are not partiers. Christians are not drunkards. We'll talk more about that phrase in just a minute later in the lesson. Fifth, going hand in hand with these other words, is uh, the word lewdness. There's another Greek word on your handout translated as lewdness, which is the one we're actually more familiar with. But here's the other one first. This one, this is a Greek word defined as cohabitation, sexual intercourse and chambering, which is, I guess, sleeping together. I looked up the term cohabitation on Google, and here's uh, what that word means. Uh, and I did put it up here already. The state of living together and having sexual relationship without being married. That's this Greek word. Uh, this only adds to the sinful activity of the night that Paul is describing for us and this sinful scene. Almost always listed with the words drunkenness and partings is the word lewdness and words like that. And we see why, right? People in an unrestrained way wishing to let loose, wanting to free themselves from all restraint for a time. Oh man, it's been a busy week, if it's been a hard week, I'd like to let loose. And so they're going to drink, they're going to dance, and many by the end of the night are going to go home with someone who's not their, their spouse. That's how the night ends. That's why it's always roped in with this, these words. Uh, that's a very common occurrence at college parties. No parents can tell them that they can't do it. No chaperones. Just a bunch of young people free to do whatever they want. And boy, do they do whatever they want. By the way, this particular Greek word in the Bible is a word that we can point to when someone is wondering if it's wrong to shack up with their significant other that they're dating, but they're not married to, and that they would like to sleep with them without being married. That's a good word. Of course, there's the word fornication, which wraps it up perfectly fine as well. But, but this is a word which carries with it the idea in the original language of cohabitation. Going home together. Being together sexually during a night of letting loose. So these are the kinds of sins. This is the type of scene Paul's talking about. These types of activity blend together in this nighttime scene. All right, number six. Here's another Greek word translated as lewdness. This is the other one that we've studied up here a lot before, which is often translated as uh, lasciviousness or licentiousness. And here's its definition. Unbridled lust. The word unbridled means uncontrolled, unrestrained lust. You're not going to control your lust. So uncontrolled lust, excess, licentiousness, lasciviousness, wantonness, outrageousness, shamelessness, insolence. Look at that word shamelessness. Uh, it's the idea of, again, I'm, I'm ready to let loose. And I'm going to do whatever my lusts bring me to do. And I'm not ashamed. I don't care. More of these, the Greek definition, you keep looking into the definition. It gives some examples. It says unrestrained acts. You're not going to listen to, to your conscience. You're going to be unrestrained in things such as filthy words. I ain't putting no filter over my mouth. I'm going to say some bad things. 
or indecent bodily movements. I'm not going to be proper. I'm going to do inappropriate things with my body. Unchaste handling of males and females. We've studied that one before. So basically the word means not deciding to de control your desires for a time. Oh, letting loose. All right. And so this could be someone saying inappropriate things. Uh, you know, releasing their mouth. They can, I'm going to say whatever I want. It could be someone moving inappropriately or pro provocatively. And it often presents itself when males and females burning in their lust for each other handle each other and touch each other in ungodly and unsanctified ways before they're married. And in ways that they would touch each other when they are married, you shouldn't be touching each other when you're not married. So this is what we're discussing you know, this is where the discussion of dancing often comes into the picture, why we believe we shouldn't be doing this type of activity. We're studying uh, about a place when unmarried, typically young people, doesn't have to be young people, by the way, but are, are not controlling the decency of their touches between someone they're not married with. Handling each other such as is not holy for two unmarried people to do. So yes, this word uh, is a broad word that can can be violated by two unmarried people. Not only on the dance floor, by the way, uh, but in the back seat of a car, this word can be violated. A young young woman sitting on a young man's lap can violate this word. And a number of different things could fit into this category of inappropriate touches of a man and a woman. But yes, when men and women dance together, uh, many, many of us know what that entails when, when two people dance together nowadays. Today we know typically a male and a, and a female will be rubbing up against each other in an unrestrained way. She'll turn around and she'll sit in his lap practically while they move to the music. We, all, we understand. Many of us have seen that, studied that. Much of this word uh, at these places of lust could include kissing, touching, and more. We know the kinds of things that happen when uh, young people lust and they want each other. So we're seeing more and more of how all these words fit together, aren't we? And what happens at these late night scenes? So we're seeing why drunkenness, partying, and lewdness typically are listed together. If you look up some of these words like licentiousness on Google, here's the definition. It's a lack of moral restraints. So you're hanging, you're hanging up your morals for the night and doing what comes natural. Isn't it? By the way, it ain't good to do what comes natural. People say that all the time. Well, just do what comes naturally. Uh, don't do that. Okay, the heart is deceitful, uh, desperately wicked. Who can know it? It'll trick you. So we talked about letting loose a moment ago. The lewdness is defined by Google or in our, trans, or in our language as vulgar sexual behavior or indecency. Lascivious is a word meaning uh, an open and unhidden sexual desire. Hey, I'm letting loose. Therefore, I'm not hiding what my sinful flesh wants. I'm going to act on these desires and I'm not ashamed about it. Then lastly, there was the word wanton. I didn't really know that word very much, but that word means sexually unrestrained. So I told you these words would paint a picture. So far, I just visualize a bunch of young people at a party or perhaps not so young people but they are not restraining, not caring, and that's essentially uh, what's being described here. It's so sad that the world today doesn't see this type of behavior as a big deal. You know, people will be part of the Church of Christ even and say, well, I mean, it's just, it's just fun. It's just doing these things. But the Bible calls it sin. All right, let's keep going on this list. Oh, we're almost done. Then we'll read the passages finally. Number seven, I'd like you to notice that these passages also highlight the word lust. Uh, the Greek word is defined simply as desire, craving, longing, desire for what is forbidden, and lust. I want something that's not mine. Maybe you're dating somebody and, and they're not yours yet. But I want them. And I'm burning in my heart for it. Number eight, going along back to the word revelry, is another Greek word translated as drinking party. So it's very similar to that word. And this is the Greek word potos, however you say it. It's defined as drinking, carousing, banqueting, partying. The King James translates it usually as banquetings. Number nine, of course, with these other words, uh, I'd like to also highlight the word fornication. That's the Greek word pornea, from which we get our word pornography. Uh, we know what fornication is. 
It is illicit sexual intercourse. Illicit means unlawful. So unlawful sexual intercourse. It's sex. Uh, it's sexual intercourse with someone who is not your lawful spouse in the eyes of God. That's fornication. Much of the time, those who party in the night, like we said, going home with someone to commit fornication, which is why it's always roped in with these words. Number 10, lastly, we'll highlight the word uncleanness. It's a Greek word defined as moral impurity, the impurity of lustful, luxurious, reckless living. That's a good word, reckless living. And uh, you can think of the, the prodigal son. He, was, he went out and, with prodigal, reckless living. That's sort of the idea here. You are dirtying up your soul with these actions you're participating in. Better yet, there's already dirtiness in your soul, which is why you're doing these things. And I think we're seeing this morning why all these words are listed together. Partying, drinking, get-togethers. While we're there, of course, we're going to get drunk. We're going to listen to music and dance with the people who are not our spouse, and we're gonna, not going to do it in a very godly way anyway, and then we're going to lust, and we're going to act lascivious with one who is not our spouse. We're going to move indecently, be loud, say maybe indecent things. That's the scene, right? We're going to defile our souls while we're fulfilling the things that our flesh wants to do. And we understand why people say these things are fun. The Bible talks about the pleasures of sin for a season. People wouldn't do these things if there weren't pleasure in all ten of these words, right? That's a lot of fun, right, they say. Okay, with all this in mind, now let's read the three passages. Now that we understand what all the words mean, let's read the passages. The first one is Romans chapter 13, and verse 13. I'm also going to read verses 12 and 14 with it. Paul writes, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. You're a Christian now. You don't, we're going to put off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light, now that we're Christians. Let us walk properly, as in the day. And here it is. Not in revelry, partying, and drunkenness, and lewdness and lust. That's actually the Greek word there for cohabitation. And not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for your flesh to fulfill its lusts. I know you want to do these things in the flesh. Your flesh naturally wants to do these things. Don't give in. Don't do them. The word provision means to pro provide or supply something for use. We're not to provide for our flesh that we might fulfill the flesh's desire. We're not to give in to what our flesh wants. We're not to make any plans to fulfill these lusts. And did you hear the things that Paul talked about? We'll put it in our language. Partying, drinking, lustful behavior such as like, like dancing and touching, uh, cohabitation, which is sleeping together, together afterwards, alluding to fornication. Notice here that Paul references these deeds as things that are done at night. Remember, we looked at that word nocturnal earlier as part of the definition of the word revelry. Typically, it's a night party, you know. And it's playing into this idea, too, of, of, of spiritual darkness, evil, wickedness. Things God, you know, God, God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. You're going to do these things. These are things that God is not for. It does not define the character of God. You're going against the character of God. I think it's kind of like what he writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse verses 5 through 8. He says to Christians, you are all sons of light. You guys are sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. And that's actually a neat thought. Christians are not people of the night, as we've been studying this morning. We don't do these types of things anymore now that we're Christians. He says in verse 6, Therefore, let us not sleep. The implication of the word sleep there, I believe, is spiritual sleep. Uh, you know, living, in, living in sin, you're, you're, you're sleeping spiritually. Don't, don't spiritually sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. That's a big word in this discussion. The positive command, you, you need to be sober now that you're a Christian. Don't be drunk, be sober. Uh, number verse 7 says, For those who sleep spiritually, those who commit the deeds of darkness, do so, what? At night. And those who get drunk are drunk, typically, at night. But let, let us who are of the day be sober. 
Do you remember when we were reading the definition of revelries, the definition of that word, and I used the word nocturnal, it said, used generally of feasts and drinking parties that are protracted till late at night and indulge in revelry. And that's what Paul uh, said about Christians here. He's like, you guys, we're Christian. We're, 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 we're children of the day. Right? Not children of the night. You see kind of the difference there? Walking in, in the light, walking in darkness. And we don't do these, quote, night activities. Secondly, how about the statement that the Apostle Peter made on this topic? This one's our second one. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Here's what Peter said using these words. He talked about a, the Christian individual who has, quote, ceased from sin. That's what a Christian does, and it's not their lifestyle anymore. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts, the lusts of men. Your, your flesh want to do these things, but you're not going to listen to your flesh anymore. But you're living now for the will of God. And he, he's, he's going to go on to explain this. He said, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. What's that mean, our past lifetime? Before we became Christian. Before we became Christians, when we, here it is, walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, two different Greek words there, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Now, quick question. Who is they and them in this passage? In regard to these, they think it's strange. You don't, you don't run with them. It's the people you used to participate with, with these, in these things. But now the implication is what? What's the, the implication? You don't do these actions with them anymore. You used to. Peter's saying, you know, before we became followers of Christ, we took part in these things all the time. You did that, that a lot in your, in your previous life, meaning before we became Christian. But now we're Christians. Those who we used to run with to engage in these activities, they think it's strange. We might use the word weird. They think it's weird. You used to do this with us, but now you don't join with us to partake. What's going on? Why don't you do these things with us anymore? And by the way, they speak evil of you when you make that decision. By the way, they're not your friends. Everything we talked about this morning are the things that a faithful Christian puts behind them. That was our former lifestyle, not our current lifestyle. We put off the deeds of darkness. Christians don't drink anymore. Christians don't party anymore. They don't let loose and let off all their restrictions anymore. No, rather, we are restrained. We are self-controlled, pursuing holiness, under control. And yes, Peter says they think it's strange that you don't do these things with them anymore. In fact, I believe very, this is very true. It makes people feel guilty when you refuse to participate in this kind of stuff. It exposes their darkness. And it brings to light what they already know themselves is wrong. And they don't like it when you stop doing it because it exposes them, makes them feel guilty. And that's why they get mad. All right, last one is uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, which is the works of the flesh. We'll read this one, and then we'll make some closing thoughts. Paul says, now the works of the flesh are obvious. Is the word there, evident. They are adultery. Fornication, we didn't even talk about adultery, but you understand that word. Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Those are some of the words we talked about. Verse 20 goes into some that we haven't talked about today, about idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders. And here's some other ones we studied. Drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By the way, you look for a verse, to, more verses to go against once saved, always saved. He's saying, hey, Christians, if you start doing these things again, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Once saved, always saved, saved makes no sense, by the way. So, now I just want, I want you to think and consider with me how powerful the phrase and the like is in this passage. I believe it's true, according to this passage, that certain scenarios might not hold all of these sins together, like we've been studying. 
but they do hold one or some of them. Hence, Paul is saying to stay away from them too. For example, so, you know, someone might invite a young Christian man to a bonfire, and perhaps there's no young ladies even present for dancing or any of that kind of So there's no dancing taking place. There might not even be music, but his buddies are all going to get together. They're going to get drunk, and they want him to tag along and be there for the night of fun and let loose. Let loose with us. Someone might say, well, you know, that's not a revelry, per se, because it doesn't meet the, you know, this full description that we've been talking about, the dancing, the music, and the lewdness. But consider what Paul is saying with the phrase, and the like. And the King James uses the, the phrase, such like. Paul is saying, Christians, such things are sinful. You know that. Drunkenness, partings, and things like that. Situations like that. The idea Paul is literally portrays in this passage is that if it resembles these events of darkness, just stay away from that kind of stuff altogether. That's kind of the idea. If it resembles a drunken get-together, if it resembles a wild party in some way, if it involves lewdness, lust, or any of these kinds of things, Christians should just stay away from that kind of stuff. I think another prime example of this principle is, uh, is seen in some of the parties put on by the public school systems for our young people. Uh, the prom, homecoming, Sadie's Hawkins, other kinds of dances like that, parties really. And the argument goes by some, well, th 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 those aren't revelries. You know, that's, that's not how Paul is describing here. Um, it's not the word Paul is describing here because nobody's getting drunk at a high school prom. There's not alcohol being passed around. And by the way, I might beg to differ that nobody's getting drunk or bef before or after prom, okay? But we understand their argument. You know, th this isn't a sinful party because there's no alcohol. That part's missing. So it's not a revelry. Well, consider with me that every other element of a revelry is present besides the drinking, if you want to go that route. And are these other things not still wrong? Think about it. Yeah, you still have the young, I mean, this is the event. The, the, they're going to dance. Young, young men and women are going to dance together. They're not married. Uh, the light is, it's dark. It goes late into the night. And it's a time where young people are encouraged to let loose. Oh, man, people talk about prom night. That you've worked so hard all year, and now it's prom. And this is a night you're going to remember. A place where, where lust uh, is prevalent. And dancing, of course, for young men and women who are not married. And quote, think about the definition, lively and noisy enjoyment. This is kind of was roped in with the, with the phrase revelry. So I believe if we're being honest, we'll understand that Paul is saying, Christians, you know, stay away from drunkenness. Stay away from wild parties of that nature and things like that. That's, that's actually what he's saying. I always point out to people the wild nature of these events that we want to send our young people to. And the Church of Christ in this country used to be far more unified that we were not going to promote such events. And they would, uh, you know, there was the junior and senior banquet where to take place at the prom, those who were in the Church of Christ would get together and have, have just a dinner. And, they, and that's, that's fine, fine to do. You can have a date. And no one's sitting on each other's laps or rubbing up against each other or anything. But, yeah, someone argues, it's not a revelry, though. But I argue... What's taken, what's taken away in the word revel, revelry is picked up in the phrase and the like. Okay? If it's not a revelry, it's awful close to the type of wild party being described in this whole lesson. Wayne Jackson, in his commentary on Romans 13.13, 13, said, The things mentioned in this verse suggest an environment of worldliness and a lack of responsible restraint. You know, would that not describe a high school prom night? To the T. By the way, many of the young couples end up committing fornication before the night is over. And what do you expect? They've been rubbed up, rubbed up against each other all night in such a way. But yes, I want you to consider the types of scenes that God has shown us in our study this morning. There, there's a certain type of atmosphere, a certain context, that of a wild party. Now, I believe we need to be careful to avoid those things. Be aware of these events, these environments of great worldliness where the deeds of darkness are taking place. 
and avoid them. Christians uh, have to consider what's a, what's a good idea, where it's a good idea to be at and where it's not. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little hands, what you do. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little hands, what you do. Um, you know, people, people have get-togethers at their houses a lot uh, in this country, sit around a bonfire. And such is the American thing to do, to whip out the beers at, most, at a lot of houses. And then the parties will go late and people get louder and more funny and everything, all of that. And that's how people of the world like to have fun. Christians don't do that. That's the idea. We could also talk a lot about weddings. Let's talk about weddings. People act like when a celebration comes, such as a joyous event of two people getting married, that this is a free pass for everybody there to engage in revelry. Well, we, we've waited our whole life to get married. Well, of course, we've got to celebrate. We can celebrate. Just don't sin. So they serve drinks to their guests. Things get wilder and wilder as the night goes on. And it's this sort of thing that these pass- this passage is talking about. I heard someone say recently, oh, yeah, I don't drink anymore, but at weddings, I can't help myself. And I let loose at weddings. Like that's, the, that's something I just, I love people, you know, the person said that. So you see, God never gives us a free pass to enjoy ourselves at a revelry or to revel ever. I believe one point I'm trying to get across this morning is that sometimes an event itself can, can be something a Christian shouldn't be, ever be a part of or think about being a part of. Something that once these things start taking place and you realize, oh, this is, this is a revelry. I need to leave and we'll walk out of there. Sometimes that's what we do at, at weddings. We'll, we'll go eat the food with them and then we leave because we know after the speeches, whatever this is, we, and it's opened up. Say, okay, now everybody let loose. I'll say, all right, I'm letting loose. See you later. I'm going home. And so that's what we need to do. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11 says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. If you study that word, fellowship, this means, when you're saying have no fellowship, it means have nothing to do with, take no part, do not share in company with, and do not co-participate in. Uh, now, you know, that's pretty clear. That puts the nail in the coffin. This, this doesn't mean, by the way, that we can't ever be around sinners. It just means that we can't fellowship their deeds. You know, we can eat with them the next morning so that we can try to bring them to Christ, but don't tag along with them the night before with their revelry. That's the idea. We always say, you know, hey, you know, Jesus, he ate with sinners, but hey, he didn't sin with sinners. And so that's the idea. Likewise, chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 7, do not take part with them. 1 Timothy 5, 22, do not share in other people's sins. 1 Peter 4, 4, do not run with them. And Romans 1, 32, do not approve of those things that they're doing. Yeah, stay away from drunk, drunkenness, revelries, and things like that. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So Paul says a Christian should not have anything to do with that kind of stuff. Just be careful that you're not being roped into that kind of stuff. That's our lesson this morning. We're trying to walk in the light because we're Christians. We're trying to be faithful until death. But if you're not a Christian this morning, you need to start this trek. Join God's family. He'll add you to his church if you follow this process. The Bible says you just got to hear the gospel. Yeah, we've done a lot of these sinful things in our past. We've got a lot of sin on our record that needs to be forgiven. How do you get it off? There's the gospel. You've got to hear about what Jesus did. Once you hear the message of Jesus, how he came down from heaven as a member of the Godhead to die on the cross, to take the punishment for the sin of the world, then you can tap into that. If you'll just repent, have a change of mind that's going to lead to a change of your life. Say, oh yeah, yeah, I understand all the deeds of darkness, all the things I wasn't supposed to do. Now I'm going to dedicate my life. If, if, and he says, if you'll, if you'll make that decision, I'll forgive you. You don't got to be perfect once you make that decision, but you got to be walking a new lifestyle, walking in the light. So repent. You'll repent, you won't perish. Uh, then confess him before men. I do believe that this is the truth. Jesus is the Son of God. And then you enter in through your baptism. You tap into it. You're baptized into Christ and you're baptized into his death. Romans 6 talks about 
And so you gain access to the cleansing blood. You're washed from your sins. You come up out of the water. Now you're a member of the Lord's church. The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. And then he said, just remain faithful until death and I'll give you the crown of life. When you slip up, just pray to God. Let him know, oh, I, I understand I slipped up. Confess that sin and repent again. And just keep doing that until the day you die. Just be faithful and you'll go to heaven. So that's a very simple setup. Let us do it this morning. So if there's anybody uh, who does not feel ready uh, to meet the Lord, either when he comes back or when you die, please have a seat on the front row. The baptistry is ready if you, if, if, if you are. And let us do these things as we stand and as we sing.